Uh, good morning, everybody, and I'd like you to welcome to this second session for this morning's uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Frances Rouen. I'm chairperson of the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, and I'm chairing this session today. And on behalf of the IIEA, I'm particularly delighted to uh, introduce the official launch of the OECD Economic Survey of Ireland. It's one of those points in, 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 uh, in time where we get that external view that I always think small countries look out and look to see what others are doing and others are saying. And this is our sort of structured opportunity way of doing it in relation to the, to the, the OECD. And obviously the context at the moment is, is, is from a global political point of view, a very tricky one with uh, the war on Ukraine affecting the Irish economy and all other economies in Europe. And, and we have also the, the challenging issues that were discussed earlier on this morning in relation to health and housing and aging population. And of course, uh, dealing with greenhouse emissions. Uh, and in this particular case, as you'll see uh, from the discussion, there's a chapter in the report from the OECD on, on, on health. So we're going to begin the session with um, a presentation on the findings by Vincent Cohen, who is the Deputy Director of Country Studies in the OECD Economics Department. And then we'll be joined by um, Minister Dunner, who's going to respond to that, to that paper. We'll also then have on the panel and we'll get Adelaide McGowan, who's the senior economist on the Ireland desk at the OECD, and John McCarthy, who some of you saw participating earlier, a chief economist in the Department of, 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 uh, of Finance. So um, just to say a few words about Vincent, he's authored and co-authored reports on a wide range of countries over many years at the OECD, served in various executive positions in the, uh, as the department's economic counsellor and as division chief. And for several years, he was the main author of the OECD Economic Outlook, which has such an important uh, impact on how countries look at the, at the world outside. Um, previously, he worked as an economist at the IMF and in the Banque de France. He holds an economics PhD from MIT, and his economic publications include numerous articles and papers, as well as two textbooks. So, Vincent, over to you. It's a great privilege for me to be here today. Uh, uh, Minister, uh, as you closed uh, your tenure as one of Ireland's longest serving and, and uh, most unflappable ministers of, of finance. And uh, I'd like to give you a, a small token of appreciation. <laughs> And thanks for all the support we've received during the preparation of this uh, economic survey. The Irish economy, uh, next slide, please. Uh, weathered the pandemic uh, extremely well. Uh, it was spared lasting damage, uh, thanks to robust exports, extensive and swift policy support, and a successful uh, vaccination rollout. I, I looked at the numbers this morning. It's, this is not in the report, so maybe it's more interesting. Uh, Ireland is now one third bigger in terms of GDP than it was pre-pandemic. I can't think of any other OECD country uh, that is uh, in this league. Uh, if we look at modified domestic demand, it's 9% larger now than it was pre-pandemic. So uh, when we say there's no scarring, indeed, uh, Ireland has remained on trend if we think the trend is around 3%. Uh, so this is, this is really remarkable. Uh, and mind-boggling, I would say. Next slide, please. Thanks to the, the support policies, labor markets have remained resilient in Ireland, uh, and uh, unemployment is low compared to other OECD countries, uh, and uh, vacancies are uh, uh, relatively high historically, not, not compared to other uh, EU countries that much, but definitely uh, uh, in historical perspective in Ireland. Next slide. Ireland has a limited exposure to Russia and Ukraine in direct terms if we set aside the aircraft leasing business. Uh, but the war, Russia's war of aggression uh, against Ukraine has of course uh, pushed up uh, domestic food and uh, energy prices as our taxi driver this morning reminded Mugi and myself <laughs> very vocally. Uh, I told her energy prices are up 43% on a year earlier in Ireland. She said, no, 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 they are up at least 100%. Uh, so, next slide, please. So, uh, inflation uh, in Ireland is about 9% on the latest numbers for headline inflation, uh, a tad less than in the euro area where it's 10%, but still uh, uncomfortably uh, high. 
And the main driver remains the, these energy prices. Next slide, please. Inflation is also spreading. Uh, core was around 5% in October. We don't have November yet. Uh, and around 60% of goods in the CPI basket are recording uh, price increases of 4% or more. So like other OECD countries, uh, the government has uh, stepped in to cushion uh, the impact of the shock on households and firms. But uh, with this context, with, with price stability at risk in the EU area, and I'm speaking here in the presence of the chairman of the Eurogroup, uh, it's important that the fiscal policy uh, does not continue to add stimulus uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the economy and that fiscal support, if needed, and some of it is indeed a need still, be temporary and more targeted than it has been uh, so far. And we note that Ireland is ahead of other uh, uh, EU countries in this respect with, uh, in budget 2023, a growing share of the support that is indeed uh, meant to be targeted. Next slide, please. These are, the, this is the usual table with our uh, macro projections. So uh, we see, uh, growth this year to around 10% uh, for, for GDP, uh, a remarkable number. Uh, we see still high inflation, uh, which will undermine growth going forward. So growth will be only around 4% uh, in 2023 and uh, only a bit over 3% in 2024. Uh, by recent standards, after the rebound, this may look uh, a, a bit... Uh, uh, subdued, but of course, if we look across the board at other OECD countries or the other EU countries, this remains extremely dynamic, helped by continued uh, dynamism uh, in your multinational dominated uh, sector. Next slide, please. So now let's turn to some of the uh, uh, key challenges we concentrate on in, in our survey, that the macro is only a small part of the, of the story. So, uh, the fiscal position is currently enviably strong. Uh, Minister, you, you are recording uh, a surplus this year for the second time during your tenure. In 2018, there, there was balance, now, now a, a surplus. This is really remarkable given the shocks that have hit the, the Irish economy. But at the same time, uh, you are facing major uh, fiscal pressures uh, down the road uh, to do with aging, so pension and health spending. Uh, with the need to ensure adequate supply of housing and the need to spend uh, for climate against climate change. Next slide. So looking at, at this year, uh, at the cornucopia, uh, uh, this is, uh, it's always great to have a lot of money come in, but as you minister, and as, as John always remind us, uh, this, and as we were reminded this morning in the first session as well, uh, uh, this money comes in large part from a very small number of uh, uh, firms. Uh, so there is a, a major concentration risk, which probably overshadows uh, any of the risks associated with what's going on with BEPS uh, at the OECD. Uh, and uh, we are really uh, very happy to see that two plus four billion euros have been put in the absolutely renamed uh, National Reserve Fund uh, for 2022-2023. Uh, this is definitely the, the way to go when, when all this money is, uh, is coming in. Next slide, please. So in the past, fiscal policy has been very pro-cyclical, uh, notably around the global financial crisis. And this uh, uh, has been felt in, in investment, the current investment needs in, in housing and healthcare are partly a legacy of this. So going forward, recurrent spending should not be allowed to drift up when revenues are exceptionally strong. And uh, the new spending rule, the 5% nominal growth spending rule, which is a break from the past, when I have it, I spend it. I will not name who, who said that, but you will know. Uh, the break with, with this uh, approach will help increase the resilience of the Irish economy to, to future shocks. Uh, and Minister, in your new role soon at the helm of public expenditure and reform, you will be well placed to ensure adherence to the rule that you have set after the present temporary deviation. Of course, this year we're spending more, but there are very special reasons. Um, and our report suggests that giving uh, legislative status to this rule could, could strengthen it. Next slide, please. So uh, 
let's look at uh, public debt. Uh, public debt is high on a per capita basis in, in Ireland, uh, which is uh, maybe an unusual angle, but a re relevant angle if we think about intergenerational equity. And, and so uh, despite all the money coming in, uh, fiscal prudence is really important. Next slide, please. It is because uh, the population is aging faster in Ireland than in many OECD countries. Uh, this was alluded to uh, and challenged a bit in the first session this morning. Uh, we are clearly uh, among those who believe that aging will bring a, a, a lot more costs for, for pensions, long-term care, and, and health. Uh, we have run simulations to 2060 uh, where uh, it appears that Ireland uh, is facing an extra 6% of GDP uh, almost in extra spending uh, down the road associated with, with these demographic uh, factors. Next slide. So we also do the, the typical debt sustainability analysis in the report uh, here to 2050. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, in the baseline scenario where no reforms are uh, put in, uh, uh, we are uh, drifting up uh, for, the, for the debt to GDP ratio. The, or, the brown line that you can see which depicts uh, uh, a scenario where there is pension reform and a better, uh, uh, greater efficiency in health spending uh, uh, it makes it possible to contain uh, public debt, even to bring down the public debt ratio. But this will require action. In particular, it will require to raise the, the pension age uh, in a context where life expectancy continues to rise across countries after the uh, hiccup, of course, associated with COVID. Next slide. This just summarizes our recommendations. Next slide. I've already mentioned those. So uh, the thematic focus of this survey is healthcare, which unfortunately is quite topical in the wake of, of COVID. But uh, the health system here is uh, really idiosyncratic. I mean, many things are idiosyncratic in like Ireland. <laughs> John, you like to talk about Irish volatility <laughs> as being an order of magnitude different from, from elsewhere, but the health system is also very uh, peculiar. Next slide. Overall, the health uh, of the Irish population has, has improved uh, and it is, life expectancy is, uh, compares quite favorably to other, to other countries. Next slide. Trying to keep to the 15 minutes, uh, I'm really running through the slides. Uh, so we had a period of retrenchment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for spending on health, uh, but uh, health spending has uh, uh, accelerated in, in recent years. And now accounts for a very sizable share of uh, overall government spending, about one fifth. Uh, and there are further pressures co coming down the road. So it's really important. Uh, our report emphasizes the, the need to uh, restructure uh, the system in, in line with Solange Care's ambitions. Solange Care, of course, was uh, sort of uh, derailed a bit by, by the pandemic, but it's important to, 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 to move ahead and to move away from a, a largely hospital-based system to one that better integrates primary care, community, and, and long-term care. Next slide, please. The system here is very centralized. And so one of the elements of Strong Care is to uh, uh, have some, some decentralization with, in particular, the creation of regional health areas. But making the most of those requires a funding model that is based on the actual needs of regional populations with improved data availability and governance, and notably by extending the use of digital tools. We, we saw this uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this is good inspiration. And the linkages between the data sets. It's very striking to see how disconnected uh, a well-known challenge here is waiting lists. Uh, uh, we think that the, the planned and ongoing initiatives to increase uh, public funding capacity uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you. Is a longstanding challenge uh, with relatively high housing related costs as a share of household expenditure close to, to 30%. Next slide. Housing is constrained by a number of factors. There's the regulation and permitting system that is complex and slow. Um, and then there is the system of judicial reviews. 
And then there are construction costs that have gone through the roof uh, uh, recently. And there is a, a lack of workers uh, to uh, build. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, the sector has more demand for workers than, than supply. In this context, we really welcome the 2021 Housing for All strategy, uh, which is very comprehensive. Uh, and, and seeks to boost residential accommodation, improve affordability, address many of these ills. Next slide, please. Uh, in our recommendations, though, we, we really think it's important to prioritize the supply side oriented measures that are, are included in this strategy. There are also demand side measures there, but uh, demand is, is strong enough. Uh, we really need to fix supply here. Next slide, please. So last but not least, uh, the uh, importance of uh, climate change. Here, Ireland is not among uh, uh, the OECD stars. Uh, and the context uh, is, um, uh, of course, uh, more difficult uh, even than we thought uh, earlier with energy security now coming uh, big time into the picture. Next slide. Like in other OECD countries, uh, additional investments and policy measures will be needed for Ireland to achieve its ambition uh, of net zero by 2050 in a cost-effective way. And we welcome in the report the establishment of carbon budgets and of sectoral emission ceilings as a first step in this direction. Next slide. So emission reduction in the power generation sector is key. Ireland has stepped up its efforts to develop renewable resources and the targets in the climate action plan are suitably ambitious, but this will require major investments in generation capacity, both onshore and offshore uh, wind turbines in particular, and in the associated uh, grid infrastructure. And like housing, streamlining and simplifying the planal and judicial review processes will be key. Next slide. Now, if we look at sectoral distributions, uh, Ireland stands out with a very large sector it's a share for, for agriculture at 36% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And transport is uh, the other big sector with 18%. Um, abatement is particularly difficult in, in agriculture, as we know in my uh, shop, because we also cover New Zealand, which is facing a, a similar challenge. Uh, without sufficient progress uh, there uh, in agriculture, uh, meeting the 2030 targets will require even greater efforts on the part of all the other sectors. Next slide, please. So in this, uh, therefore, our, one of our recommendations includes to price, price the methane emissions, uh, and the other is to realign transport policies to facilitate the provision and use of low or no carbon travel alternatives to private cars. Minister, Ambassador, colleagues, uh, the OCD will continue to work with Ireland on all these reforms and to help uh, deliver uh, sustainable and equitable growth. We're reminded in the first session that Ireland stands out with a relatively uh, 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 inclusive uh, income distribution after tax. Uh, this is indeed a very uh, uh, precious uh, feature. And we will continue to work with you, Minister, also in your other job, your, your, your night job, or, or I don't know how to call it, as ongoing chair of the Eurogroup, for which uh, warmest congratulations. Minister, could I ask you to go to the podium, please? And as you know, this is the unflappable Minister for Finance and the uh, very hardworking um, uh, Minister who's also uh, playing on the major stage within Europe. I think everybody in the room knows who you are, and I'm sure everybody online knows who you are, but great pleasure to have you here to respond to the OECD report. Thank you. Well, good morning, Francis. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to begin by welcoming you all to Dublin Central. Uh, it's a great privilege to have such a gathering in the heart of this wonderful constituency. And as I um, approach the end of my tenure, in the Office of Minister of Finance, there are a few places that I would rather be than be engaging with the Irish Institute of International uh, and European Affairs, and also engaging with an organization that I respect so much and plays such a valuable role in economic policy here in Ireland and across Europe and indeed across the world than the OECD. And it's particularly appropriate that I should be here with the OECD this morning, given the um, final 
phase of agreement in relation to the minimum effective tax directive in Brussels this week, which of course the OECD played such a critical role within across the world. And if I look at uh, the uh, over five years I've now spent as Minister of Finance, I think it's fair to say that the organisation that I had the most engagement with on many topics within corporate tax were my good colleagues and partners within the OECD. And it is so important now that we're able to make progress in operationalizing the political agreements of now over a year ago, because they are vital for the stability of global taxation and global trade in the years ahead. And also because the alternatives to this approach would pose so many risks, uh, particularly to small open economies. What I will do, of course, in my time with you this morning is concentrate the rest of my comments on this really important and really, really timely economic survey of Ireland. And I think it's to the credit of the OECD to Vincent and his team that not only do they engage with leading quantitative indicators regarding the performance of our economy, but amidst the qualitative indicators they engage with, they find time to engage with our tax advisors. And I can only hope this is an approach that is carried out in New Zealand and in Japan in the time ahead. And Vincent, we look forward to benchmarking the feedback you get from them. But I am particularly happy to be here uh, with Vincent and with his team because I had the opportunity to engage with them earlier on in the year. And I saw at first hand, as I always do with the OECD, the sophistication of their engagement that has led to a very nuanced, a very insightful, and indeed a very wise evaluation of where the Irish economy stands at the moment. And as we evaluate this latest analysis, we do so in the context of the Irish state last week, marking its centenary. And indeed the title of this morning's event acknowledges that 2022 is also the 100 year anniversary of the Department of Finance. And we've had many opportunities across this year to reflect on the history that has got us to this point. And we've also had some lovely opportunities to reflect on the history of the Department of Finance. And as a book lover, it is to my great pride that we published volume two of the history of the Department of Finance that's available in all good bookshops today at an appropriate price. And I'd recommend it all to you, if not for Christmas reading, but certainly for reading for 2023. But today is about looking to the future. It is also a discussion that has been greatly enabled by the report of the Commission on Taxation and Welfare, which is a very fitting accompaniment to the launch of the report by the OECD today. And this is because both of these reports focus on the long term, on the structural dimensions of our economy and our public finances. And this focus on the long term is particularly needed because as a politician, and with my colleagues in the Department of Finance, we spend so much of our time grappling with the issue of today, with the urgency of the short term. And as the department moves into its second century, a continued focus on what matters beyond the day-to-day, month-to-month, even year-to-year, -year, is just vital. And that is why there are so many themes that are worthy of consideration in the report today. And that's why this event is also so valuable. With regard to the OECD, we are very proud to have been among the founding members of the OECD more than six decades ago. It is a relationship that is really important 
to the Department of Finance and to the government of Ireland. And we believe it is a relationship that is positive and we hope mutually beneficial. The OECD provides evidence. It provides insights and it provides independent analysis. And by doing this, it of course facilitates international collaboration. And as a small open economy, we benefit hugely from this engagement. And I also see the OECD as being a great resource to the work of the department and indeed to my work as minister. And the founding principles of the OECD of free trade, of transparency, and equitable growth are themes that continue to be very relevant to the economic development of Ireland. And this report speaks to those themes. The OECD is renowned for the quality of its work. And this report, this study, is so consistent with that reputation. It highlights what we're doing well. But it's equally clear upon, about those areas in which we can improve upon. And it comes, of course, at a time of such global uncertainty. The pandemic posed such a major challenge. And just as we emerged from that searing test, Russia launched its appalling war on the people of Ukraine with all of the security, humanitarian, and we're focusing here today on the economic consequences of that war. Today, however, Ireland has weathered those economic consequences relatively well. The short-term economic outlook for the Irish economy, as noted here in this report today, is broadly in line with that of my department. And as inflationary pressures and higher interest rates lower growth, uh, excuse me, lower demand, growth in the Irish domestic economy is expected to subdue into next year. And similarly, as some of our trading partners experience tough economic conditions, our exports to them would be affected. However, the solid position of our public finances before the pandemic has enabled us to respond forcefully to those challenges. We've been able to provide significant support while at the same time continually making the case that we can't do everything. The role of government is to protect in particular the most vulnerable and budget 2023 aim to do that, also aim to provide broad-based support up to a certain level while avoiding compounding our inflationary challenges at home. We want to be in a position to do the same again in the future. And sensible management of our public finances is critical to doing this. And this is why we do aim to stay inside the parameters of the medium term budgetary framework, which was set out last week, uh, last year. However, critically, in budget 2023, I provided for nearly 1% of national income to be deposited into the National Reserve Fund this year, with nearly 2% to be transferred next year. And this will ensure that permanent increases in public expenditure are not financed using potentially transitory corporate tax receipts. And I want to emphasize that point. It's been a long standing observation regarding the risk of corporate tax receipts changing in the future. It's an observation and an analysis that has been led by the Department of Finance. 
as we come to the end of 2022, we will do that with an exchequer surplus in November of 12.1 billion euro, having deposited 2 billion euro into a national reserve fund. So we've experienced another shift change in corporate tax receipts since 2019 that has not funded permanent changes in spending or permanent changes in taxation. It has funded, as the pandemic receded, a significant improvement in our public finances. The critique that we occasionally offered of ourselves, that we heard from others, has been comprehensively responded to with that level of surplus and with the decision regarding the reserve fund. And we need to do this, not just because of the risk of what could happen to tax streams in the future, but also because, as Vincent emphasized, Irish public debt on a per capita basis remains very high. We are now in the midst of a significant improvement of our debt dynamics, but that can't take away focus from the fact that our stock of debt per person is still high. And this is why delivering budget surpluses will help us to achieve a continued decline in our debt to national income ratio in the coming years, and also make progress in moderating the stock of debt itself. And we'll use those improved public finances to make progress on many other issues that matter in our economy and to our society. And housing is obviously such a leading challenge. This year we'll see around 28,000 homes completed in Ireland. We're making progress. We need to do more. And I welcome the focus on this report and how we can prioritize supply side policies. Climate change is also correctly identified as a key challenge. We need to have the right policies in place to respond back to this existential challenge to our civilization. And this is why last year, Ireland bought on a statutory basis a target of net zero emissions by 2050, as well as an interim target of reducing emissions by 51% in 2013. This is such an ambitious target, but it's one we have to reach, and no effort is being spared in getting to that point. However, I should emphasize that I don't view this transition as purely a negative one. It creates great opportunities for investment, for green growth, and critically, given our natural resources, it is a great economic opportunity for Ireland. And then turning briefly to the final theme of the report, I very much welcome the analysis with regard to performance and efficiency within our health service. And while I believe we have made progress, the focus on this report on rising healthcare demand and its interaction with our aging population is an important issue that we need to continue to address in the time ahead. But overall, this report does show that for now, we are in a relatively good macroeconomic position. We have weathered very recent storms, but we are conscious of what is yet to come. Our economy, our public finances are critical in allowing us to do this work. We have a young population, we have a productive business sector, and we do have the potential for a different form of growth in the years ahead. And our position in the world as a democratic, pro-enterprise country at the heart of Europe, which is innovative, which is dynamic, 
is one that many of my predecessors over the past century would have dreamed of. But now we need to ensure that in the next century, we do even better. And engagement with our partners in the OECD will help us do this. So I therefore want to conclude by thanking Vincent, his team, for their excellent work in preparing this survey and for joining us here today. And I want to thank you all again for your attendance. And I look forward to the discussion across the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And uh, we'll now proceed to the final part of our discussion in, in the form of a panel. And uh, just for those of you in the room, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. So by raising the, the, the relevant hand, uh, Mike will come to you. And for those of you on Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A function, uh, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. And I'll see if they come in here on the tablet. Um, so just joining the panel today, we have two additional uh, members to the two speakers we've had. Uh, Muge Adelaide McGowan, who's the Senior Economist at the Ireland Desk at the OECD, and you're very welcome to Dublin, and, and uh, uh, your taxi drive back to the airport was probably be a major research project for, for both of you. Um, and uh, John McCarthy, who's um, Senior Econ Chief Economist in the Department of, of Finance. And I'm just going to ask John to say a couple of words, because he would have dealt very closely with the team going through, so he's going to say a few words before we do the Q&A. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Francis, and uh, thanks to, to Vincent for, for the presentation. I mean, just following up what, what Francis there, it was a pleasure to work with, with Vincent, with Muga, and, and other members of the team over, over the past six months. Um, and, you know, the sort of cross-country comparison, uh, the sort of learning from best practice is where I think that the OECD really enjoys a, a comparative advantage and, and I think the report provides uh, lots of food for, for thought. Just very, you know, moving off on a tangent ever so uh, briefly on the taxi driver theme. I'm, I'm, I, I remember so 15 years ago when uh, the Troika was, was in Dublin and uh, they got a taxi from Dublin Airport to the Department of Finance and uh, the whole issue was about uh, uh, bilateral loans uh, amounting to 64 billion it was uh, at the time and they reached government buildings and they asked uh, the taxi driver what the uh, what the fare was and he, in, in true Dublin uh, uh, fashion he turned around with the handout and said 64 billion yeah. um, so listen I can be very brief I just want to offer some thoughts on uh, some of the cyclical and structural factors uh, currently shaping the Irish economy. And there will be quite a bit of, of, of overlap with what the, what Vincent has, has mentioned there. I mean, just by way of background, the department's baseline projection uh, is one in which the economy experiences a relatively shallow and relatively short downturn. Um, but I think I would characterize it as one in which the level of economic activity in Q4 of next year will essentially be the same as the level of economic activity in the second quarter of, of this year. So essentially we're talking about a, a flatlining of, of activity over the next four or five quarters. I think there's three sort of forces behind these uh, the, the headwinds. The first, of course, is the, the terms of trade shock, the, the energy price shock, uh, which we're all familiar with. But what I think we've seen over the past couple of months is a broadening of some of those inflationary pressures. And just to kind of give some numbers there, the CSO in the, in the CPI basket covers about 620 items, 620 goods and services. 75% of those, so three quarters of those are now running at inflation rates in excess of, of 5%, okay? So it's gone from being a very much a, uh, you know, an energy price shock to a more multi-dimensional issue. And I think that's the case both in, in Ireland and, and elsewhere. And there is a very legitimate question that economists are now asking as to whether we're at a tipping point, as to whether we're moving from a sort of, you know, the great moderation into a sort of a new regime kind of, of situation. And of course, when I talk about the great moderation, I'm talking about the three or four decades in which 
you know, the volatility of economic output was much less than previously. And the level of, or the rate of inflation was much lower uh, than would have been the case prior to that because of outsourcing, because of elongation of supply chains, because of the integration of China into the International Division of Labor, et cetera. So there is a real legitimate question there as to, as to whether we're into a sort of regime change. The second issue then that's sort of uh, behind the, the flatlining activity is of course uh, the monetary policy cycle. Uh, everyone is aware of the sort of the front loading of uh, policy normalization. Uh, uh, the policy rates in the euro area up by about 200% basis points uh, over the past year or so. If we were having this conference tomorrow, I think the figure would, would, would be even higher. And of course, that's a very aggressive pace of, of monetary uh, tightening. And as I think everybody knows, monetary policy operates with a lag. So you're going to see the impact of that weighing on activity over the next uh, year or so. The third factor then is sort of the external demand, where I think it's fair to say that the silver linings are, are few and far between. Continental Europe, you're looking at the, the epicenter of the, the energy prices. Although I do think the risks have shifted from winter of this year to the winter of next year. There's a lot of stories there now we will get through. There is certainly a pathway through, I think, uh, you know, the winter of 2002, winter 2003 into the following winter. So I think that the problems are, 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 are for, for next winter. In the UK, of course, obviously still a major trading partner for Ireland. We're seeing serious cyclical issues but I guess I would be more worried about some of the structural issues there. And everybody is aware of uh, very weak productivity growth, uh, anemic investment, uh, some problems on the, the current account, a shrinking of, of trade, et cetera. So real structural problems there, uh, which, which will confront us in, in years to come. In the US, obviously, we're seeing a slowing of, of demand. As, uh, as monetary policy tightening takes effect. So you have sectors that are sensitive to the interest rate cycle, like residential investment, really beginning to, to come back. And then the other issue then, of course, is the, uh, the disruption to the, the Chinese property bubble and, and the potential for, for spillovers there. And of course, we're also seeing other issues in, in outside advanced economies. Uh, so, you know, we've seen exchange rate realignments uh, that is causing pressure for emerging market economies by way of, of capital outflows, et cetera. Uh, although I have to say, I mean, this time last year, you know, we would have thought that, you know, the level of capital outflows, the rate of, of policy tightening in, in advanced economies would have had a more detrimental impact on, on emerging market economies. So maybe some resilience there. Lots of emerging market economies have been accumulating reserves over the past couple of years. The bigger problem maybe is in, in lower income countries where you're seeing you know, debt distress, et cetera. Uh, a lot of these countries took on dollar denominated debt with the appreciation of the dollar debt service costs and then are, 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 are rising. And something like 60% of, uh, of uh, low income countries are looking at some form of, of debt distress. So obviously a very, very difficult economic backdrop and then the question is, what would justify or what justifies our assumption of, of a short and shallow shock against this very difficult background? Now, the one point I would say here is this is our baseline scenario, and it's certainly not difficult to envisage a more problematic or a more severe uh, scenario. But I think there's four factors that really would sort of underpin our, our analysis. First, I think, is the resilience of the labor market. We've seen a, a rapid recovery in, in labor demand. We've also seen a recovery in, in labor supply. So, I mean, if you look at participation rates, for instance, they're two percentage points behind where they would otherwise be if there hadn't been a pandemic. And this, this contrasts greatly with the likes of, of the UK, where you know, you're seeing this big quiz, the great resignation or whatever. The, the labor force is about half a million below it was, uh, below the levels in, in, in pre-pandemic. Um, also important, I think, is the strength of private sector balance sheets. Uh, household balance sheets are in a much better position than they were 15 years ago. The leverage ratio, which had been about two uh, 
um, in sort of you know 20, 2007, et cetera, is now below one. Uh, we see that households are still saving about one euro in, in, in every five, uh, and they have accumulated, of course, a lot of, a lot of excess savings. Similar situation in, in, in the SME sector where, uh, you know, they have deleveraged over the, the past decade or so. So from a sustainability perspective, certainly private sector balance sheets are, are in much better shape. And you see this from balance of payments data. So even if you exclude the multinational sector, um, you know, Irish residents, be they the household sector, be they the SME sector, the government sector, the financial sector, are now net lenders to the global economy. Again, 15 years ago, the same sectors were borrowing about four or 5% of national income from, from abroad. So uh, I think that's a great strength. The financial sector then, um, you know, the reforms that have been implemented over the past 15 years or so, including those at a European level, it's in a much better shape. So the financial sector, and I guess the pandemic was the first real test of the domestic banking sector, uh, you know, it hasn't been an amplifier of the uh, of the cycle during the pandemic. And then the other issue then is the uh, the fiscal support uh, measures that have been put in place. And I think various organisations, including the OECD analysis published today, show that the overall approach has been broadly correct, cushioning household and SME incomes while at the same time preserving price signals, which I think is, is, is absolutely crucial. Um, I'm going to finish now, Francis. Um, um, so listen, I mean, just to conclude, the, the OECD report does provide uh, lots of food for thought, and uh, government will, will be considering some of those. Finally, on, on, a, on a personal level, I think this is the last time myself and the minister will be on the, the same panel. Uh, I think it's been five or six years. I'm losing track of time. Uh, it's obviously been a challenging number of years with several black swans. Uh, but I think uh, we have enjoyed the, the six or seven years together. And uh, I wish you best in, in the Department of Public Expenditure. Thanks, Francis. Thank you, um, John. So um, one of the things that that uh, came out of actually of, of, of it comes out of the report, but comes out of the general context in which we lie is the, you know, the current challenges are massive. So how do you get focus on the medium to longer term issues uh, in, in countries? Because it, it's really very hard in terms of political challenges, in terms of what the media tends to deal with the immediate, not with those medium to longer terms. And Vincent, I'm wondering if there's anything in the OECDs uh, looking at other countries that would point a way in which to try to get that focus onto the, to the medium to longer term issues, because they're clearly where we need to be. Well, I think it, it's um, difficult to disentangle the short and uh, longer run challenges. If we look at the energy crisis, uh, of course, it hits us as a short run challenge, but it highlights our dependence on imports of, of fuel from uh, unfriendly uh, parts of the world and, and therefore highlights the need to accelerate uh, the transition towards uh, renewables and other cleaner forms of, of energy. So. Uh, I think uh, uh, even though uh, we're policymakers are faced with the need to cushion the shock, there's also an opportunity to raise awareness uh, about the longer run uh, challenges. Uh, likewise, if public finances are hit by the, the costs of, of support, uh, this highlights the longer run uh, uh, challenges of sustainability. Um, public debt ratios across the OECD are now 20 percentage points of GDP on average higher than they were before the pandemic. And even before the pandemic, we were very worried about how uh, we would deal with those aging and other longer run uh, fiscal pressures. Minister, would you have any, I mean, in the Irish context, do you see that as a big problem in, in that ability to get serious focus on the issues that, that we know are there? I mean, I noticed some of the OECD reports, that report on, on the chapter on, 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 on health you know, contains recommendations, which are at least 10 years old, because I know I was involved in drawing up some of them myself, so they know that at least that age, but getting the, the traction that's needed for these long-term adjustments that are there. Yeah, I, I would be cautious about an approach uh, that uh, suggests that uh, wouldn't it be great if we could focus less on the short term to create more capacity for the long term? Because... Uh, our society expects us also to give equal priority to where we are in the here and now. And rather interestingly, many of the short-term 
challenges that we now have are the pre-shocks to longer term challenges impacting and changing our society. And I think the energy one is an excellent example of it. That actually many of the steps that we need to take to respond back to our energy supply and energy affordability challenges, many, though not all, are consistent with what we need to do for the medium term and long term as well. But even accepting the premise of your question, and as I alluded to in my own uh, statement, it's a continual challenge that uh, I face. How you deal with the private members motion of the week, how you deal with the press conference of the hour, while trying to create the ability to think about where you want to be in a few years' time. Ultimately, it depends on institutions, it depends on frameworks, and then it depends on our civil service and our political system trying to create the capacity to think into the medium term as well. And I think the OECD report and indeed John's excellent summary of where we are now gives us some credit for making progress on that, but I think is equally open about how we can do that. That's the point I'm trying to, trying to get at is it, it, it's always the medium term issues are always there. The immediate ones are the ones everybody's very conscious of and it's trying to balance those two. And, and, and I think that that's, a, that's a, a particular challenge to get something like, for example, the OECD report and what's in it today out into general discussion more widely, because that's really the value of the, the external viewpoint and putting it in context. And I think we're very uh, dependent, I think, on our media to make sure that that happens, because it's really is a such substantive amount of material in the report, so many recommendations that should be discussed publicly and would like to see more of that, more of that happening. Could I ask if there's some questions in the room that anybody would like to put to the um, OECD or to the minister? Would you want to ask any particular questions straight away? Okay, if, if not, could I come back to the uh, another issue about adjusting from the short to the long term? And that is, you know, amount of um, uh, resource put aside for capital investments versus recurrent when you're coming into difficult situations and you're trying to manage them. Uh, and I'm just wondering again whether either of our, our panelists in the OECD uh, would, would come would sort of refer to that issue. In, in other words, making sure that when you're in a tricky situation, that, that capital doesn't take too much of the heavy lifting and that the recurrent, and understandably for the reasons the minister said, recurrent issues must be, must be dealt with. Well, I would just underline that the 5% number one growth rule that has been introduced in 2021 is a helpful tool to. Uh, protect uh, uh, the need uh, for, for investment over, over the longer run, uh, um, yeah, even though it may seem restrictive it, 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 in the short run in some circumstances. Uh, I think it's an important uh, anchor uh, and uh, it is consistent with fundamentals in the sense that it is consistent with a 3% underlying trend growth of some uh, relevant measure of uh, domestic economic activity plus 2% inflation, 2% inflation. <laughs> Uh, sounded high a few years ago, now sounds uh, eerily low, uh, uh, but um, uh, this, this, this would be uh, a way to... The issue with inflation, I'm kind of old, old enough to remember the big inflationary periods of the past, which went on and on for long periods, but it is interesting to see even signs in the States of something beginning to moderate, and we're, we're all, but we all have to deal with inflation now, because back to the Minister's point, everybody feels it every time they go to the shop, so it's a very immediate impact that people have. Yeah, and I, I, I go back to the uh, excellent graph that was up there regarding what happened to our co capital stock and investment in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And uh, I, I always have a memory of, of walking by Finsbury Shopping Centre and a number of buses overtaking me. And uh, I was struck by how empty the buses were. And I also, of course, vividly remember that time in our history in where we had an abundance of houses and most of them in the wrong place. And I think at that point in time, in which our economic activity had become so low that we were not able to use the capital stock that we had built up in an adequate way, it does put a bit of context regarding the capital decisions that were made at the time. Not to mention, of course, the fact that we were in a funding crisis. 
but certainly my abiding insight from all of that is the medium term consequences of public capital investment in our economy, underinvestment in our economy, but also critically, and this is a persistent euro area challenge, private sector investment in the European economy never recovered from the global financial crisis. And what that means for our standards of living and what that means indeed for Europe and Ireland's place in the world is still a legacy that we are responding back to at the moment, which is why our national capital plan and the 5% spending rule, I think, is really valuable. Uh, two questions, Dermot and Dan, if you bring the mic over. Dermot first and then Dan. Uh, hi, uh, Dermot O'Leary from Good Buddies. Um, question on the fiscal rules uh, aspect of it. Um, you know, it's been commented previously that perhaps the, the rules that applied at a European level prior to the pandemic were inappropriate for, for Ireland. Can I get a, maybe a comment from uh, an Irish perspective or, or a European perspective or an OECD perspective in terms of what kind of principles you'd like in the new rules when they perhaps come into being in, in 2024 as is proposed now? So I think there were two challenges about the Stability and Growth Pact as constituted and implemented before the global financial crisis. First one is, in retrospect, it didn't give adequate, way, adequate recognition for the role of macroeconomic imbalances within an economy and that how that could significantly influence your fiscal performance. At the time, and clearly in retrospect, so much of our fiscal performance was driven by where we were with the level of credit within our economy. And that uh, uh, relationship wasn't something that was relevant to the fiscal rules then. And then secondly, of course, uh, is the issue of uh, the credibility of the rules in terms of how they were implemented before the global financial crisis. If I look at the debate that is underway now, and the Commission brought forward a communique with regard to all of this on the 9th of November, and the debate is now properly and substantively beginning within the European Union, I think two qualities that are important to me in the plans that have been brought forward. The first one is, is I think there is a debate that we need to have regarding how uh, debt and deficit correction plans, because they need to be credible, they will need to reflect the different national dimensions of each economy. But the quid pro quo for that would then be how the commitment to implementation of those plans can be genuinely credible and implemented, given the experience that we had of the last rules over 15 years ago. Do you have any insight to that coming from the OECD? Does the OECD get into that space of if you did like the design of systems that work best across a range of diverse economies? Uh, well, we observe that rules is better than no rules, uh, but rules that are not uh, abided by suffer from credibility problems, and, uh, as we've seen in the European context. So it's very important indeed that the, the new setup be uh, both. Uh, more tailored to uh, uh, the diversity of countries that make up the membership of, of the European Union, uh, but also guarantee uh, a greater commitment to, to implementation than we have seen so far, rather than waivers. Uh, um, of course, we have witnessed a series of extraordinary shocks in, in short succession. Uh, uh, we may hope that we won't see so many black swans uh, swarming around in the future, but, but we don't know out to be black elephants in the room, actually, if we think about it, and, and security supply being, being, being one of them. Uh, Dan has it. Dan O'Brien has a question. Yeah, Dan from the Institute. Uh, a question to Muga and, and Vincent, uh, maybe on the healthcare aspect, uh, on the healthcare aspect of the report. You mentioned that spending on healthcare is comparatively high, uh, but you also say working conditions are poor. Could, could you maybe, if you have any insights as to why there's plenty of inputs, but working conditions seem to be to be bad. Any insights on, on that observation? Um, I think uh, if you think about this whole picture, we've been talking about um, underinvestment in a no number of areas. So I think the health system has been suffering from underinvestment over, 
uh, more than a decade. So there are some legacy issues in terms of low investment. So um, I think uh, now in, uh, health spending has increased. So we're talking about the current situation, but there are all these legacy issues that uh, uh, that like uh, number of beds or staff conditions or uh, the, uh, the quality of infrastructure. So this is what we try to balance in the report that, okay, these are the issues and uh, there are reforms and there's now spending but now spending has to be efficient. So you need to have value for money for all this extra spending that's going to, into the health system uh, to make sure that the reforms that are ongoing deliver the results. Um, so we look at the, is with this kind of inputs that's going, what are the results? So for example, in Ireland, life expectancy gains have been very high. So the, the aggregate outcome is quite well, uh, but of course, uh, then you have to compare with, inter is with other OECD economies if countries that are spending less but having similar outcomes. So um, I think the, the idea is spending efficiency that's our, uh, their, our main message. Jason, did you have anything to add to that? No, um, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the main author of the chapter is not here with ah, us uh, in person. That's fine. I think he's the only one in the OECD who understands your health system. Uh, well, it's, 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 <laughs> as, as somebody who spent 15 months of my life on health, I cannot believe how complex it is. And it, it, it does take account of it. And there's noticed the quality of the of the references and what he's considered in chapters. It's really very, it's really very, very thorough. I mean, I suppose we could just, uh, I mean, a final issue which comes up, and it's, it's, it's implicit in some of your recommendations here today, and I'm not going to put those recommendations to the minister to, to respond to, but it's that notion of, of um, having recommendations and the speed of implementation. And I'm just wondering from an OECD perspective, um, is, there, is there any best practice to be learned in terms of how one uh, better realizes the implementation um, process. I mean, you have the housing for all policy and it's getting done and yet you've got to, you know, you don't want to move away to another policy, which sometimes the, the expectation is, oh, there's, there's some silver bullet out there. There's some great idea we haven't had. There isn't. It's actually all about good, good steady policy making, you know, um, and, and, and its implementation. I'm just wondering, is there anything on the implementation that you found in OECD countries that works better? Uh, I think it's very uh, idiosyncratic. Um, some countries are much more pragmatic than others. Some countries uh, uh, really uh, <laughs> uh, enjoy uh, beautiful uh, plans, uh, but, but then uh, don't focus sufficiently on how they are implemented over time. Some problems, uh, some countries face greater political instability than others, which complicates uh, implementation or have a more divided parliament th than others. So. Uh, it's very country specific, and we don't have any uh, recipe <laughs> that we can <laughs> come up with. Do you want to comment on that? It's that, it's that you know, we get these policies, we get these recommendations, and then it's it's the speed at which we can manage to because maybe we're not resourcing ourselves well enough to do the implementation. So is that part of our our, our problem? It, yes, and uh, uh, I think it is a challenge that we share with many other democracies. I mean, I'm, I'm always reminded, um, I'll be careful about saying this, in the IIEA, in the company of the OECD, but that occasional source of political insight and wisdom, which is uh, the In the Thick of It, that great series about political life in the UK. And there's a wonderful scene when a minister is on the way to a school to do a policy announcement. And I think your senior minister rings him up and says, you can't make that announcement now. And the panicked minister turns around to his advisors, his civil servants, and he says, I need a new idea to announce in 10 minutes time. And his civil servants say to him, right, you want us to come up with an idea that won't cost anything, that will make a big difference to people's lives and that nobody has thought of before. And the minister goes, yes. And unsurprisingly, they don't deliver such an idea. Um, but I think it just does illustrate the point that you're making, which is for very understandable political and democratic reasons, there's a constant focus. And it's understandable and legitimate and it's right regarding what is the response of today in feeding back and responding to the conditions of our society. And then as you say, what we need to do it's in trying to respond back to that, it is to make focus then on those things 
that bit by bit over a longer period of time can make a difference. But surely there's a case to make that over the last number of decades, we've managed to do that and managed to make a difference. Certainly over the lifespan of our state, there's a strong case to be made about that. And I go back to the earlier question that you put to me there. I do think it's about the value of institutions, international, domestic. I think it's about the value of policy frameworks that a government manages for a year or two. And then unsurprisingly, as a politician, I would then make the case for the political centre being the other vital ingredient in that mix. And I think it's 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 the it's the uh, that's very 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 um well well placed reply in terms of as you all as you always do uh, with 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 in in response to the question of that but it it is an issue of um decisions require the political makeup but the actual delivery is around what people talk about about the standing capacity of the public service to actually deliver things. So, so you know, you've got to go through the democratic process, you've got to have all of those debates and everything that's that's there. But then the question is how quickly can we deliver it? And I noticed some of the OECD recommendations directly would would be around that and ability to actually implement what government agrees. Ireland have been uh, incredibly well served and enabled by the quality of the Irish Civil Service. And I see this in the Department of Finance, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, and I could go through many other government departments. Do they, do we get everything right? Of course not. It's, we're human. It's an imperfect world. But, by, but, but overall, if I look at the culture and the expertise and the focus that is there, and we have a civil service that I think reflects the best in our, in our country at times. And then what we are gradually doing is building up agencies that are very capable of making a difference. I look at the National Transport Authority, to what they're doing in transport, um, I believe is really, really strong. And if I look at it more economically, if I would look at the IDA, Enterprise Ireland, the National Treasury Management Agency, uh, Maeve Carton, the chairperson is here today, the Revenue Commissioner, I, I think they're institutions that you can make the case that when it comes to delivery, they can do it really well. That's what we've had, and I think this is, so it's not actually around, uh, it's, it's around recognizing that the economy is so much bigger. You know, when we hit the five million population, I kind of thought, wow, that was yeah. just a moment I never expected to see in my, 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 my lifetime. And then we basically have a much more complex uh, enterprise sector. We have a much more complex society. Sure. And, and, and you know, what's required to deliver to that from central government and from the various agencies is growing all the time. I suppose that's the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's around that it's around that issue rather than somebody's not doing a job that's being done. It's just completely and the other completely. space. Completely. And I'm ever confident that if I'm ever in that taxi with the Irish Civil Service looking for that idea, they'll come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would, I would, I would, uh, um, I, th I think the taxi points are always a good reflection point. As a basis for policy, I have my, I have my reservations on the basis of my own experience. Can I uh, thank you all for the, um, the, the, uh, present, both the presentation this morning, Minister, for your reply, and John, for your, your, or your input, and Ruby, your, your uh, input as well into the panel. Uh, can I thank all of you here in the room for the, the, uh, the questions? And uh, we'll, we'll end the session now. And just, just, just to note, this was a great occasion at which to launch the um, OECD report today. Thank you.